Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Tanisha Shields, and I am Senior Land Services Officer with Western Local Land Services. Today, we will be hearing from our district vet, Trent McCarthy, about preparing your rams for joining. You should see the following control panel on your screen. If you don't, click the orange arrow to display the control panel. Here is where you can ask questions and also choose your audio option. You are in listen only mode, so that means that you can hear us, but we can't hear you. And today's presentation will be recorded and you will be sent a link to the recording within 24 hours of today's webinar. We will be answering the questions you have already sent through in a registration form in today's webinar. Throughout the webinar, if you have any more questions, please ask these by typing them into the questions box. Trent will then answer your questions. I will start today's webinar with a quick poll. This helps us to gauge who is joining us today and also to check that the program is working correctly. I'll just launch that poll for you all now. So the poll question is, what is your industry role? Are you a sheep producer, cattle producer, goat producer, mixed species producer, or an advisor? If you have trouble answering the poll question, you may need to exit the full screen mode in order to answer that. Thank you, I've got 100% of votes, so I'll close that poll question now and share the results with you all. So of everyone attending today, we have 60% sheep producers, 20% mixed species producers, and 20% of advisors. Thank you all for completing that poll. I will now hand over to Trent. Trent is a district vet with Western Local Land Services based in Baronga. He has been working with us at LLS for around two years. His main involvement with RAM checks has been through examination of RAMs at ovine brucellosis testing time. All right, I'll just make you the presenter now, Trent. Perfect, we can see your screen. Welcome everyone um, and thank you for joining the Are Your Rams Ready For Joining webinar this evening. My name is Trent McCarthy. I'm the district veterinarian based at Baronga for Western Local Land Services. Uh, I hope you all enjoy the webinar this afternoon and get something out of this presentation and are able to take something back to your, um, your production systems at home. Um, we only have an hour or so today, so we may not be able to go into the full depth um, or full detail on some of these topics that are raised in today's webinar. However, if this kind of topic interests you, um, there, there generally are full day courses run on this. Um, ramping up Repro would be one example, and hopefully those courses will be up and running again soon. Um, if you have any questions or comments, please just place them in the chat or comments bar, and we'll try to answer them at the end of the webinar. Okay, we might just start with a quick poll just to see where we're all at. All right, I've just launched that poll for you there, Trent. Um, the question to everyone is, do you perform a check of your RAMs prior to joining? And if so, what does this involve? Um, you do not check, you look at the RAMs from a distance, do you just buy new rams from the stud each year or are you getting hands on every ram and examining them closely? Very good, we've got some votes coming in. I'll um, close that poll down in five, four, three, two, one. Close that poll. Just share the results with you all. So there you go, Trent, we've got 20% of viewers who do not check, 40% are buying new rams from the stud each year and 40% are getting hands on every ram and examining closely. Perfect, that's really good to hear. We've got a couple more poll 
questions for you all, so bear with us. Here comes the second one. We've got how much on average do you spend on RAMs? Please select the option that best suits your business. All right, that's 100% of votes. We're getting quite speedy now. I'll close that and share the results with everyone. So we've got 17% spending 100 to 5 hundred dollars half of the people in the audience are spending five hundred to a thousand dollars and then the remaining are a thousand to two thousand all right one last poll question for everybody just launching that now what percentage of rams to use do you usually join at less than one and a half percent one and a half percent two percent two and a half percent or three percent or more great job everyone we've got a hundred percent of votes so just share that result with you all we've got pretty even mix of percentages there for you Trent okay perfect thanks for that everyone okay so first of all I guess my first question is um, what is the purpose of the RAM? I guess obviously they're critical for, for reproduction. So if we don't have any RAMs present in our flocks, obviously we're gonna have no lambs. Um, and any issues we do have in our RAM team can lead to reduced conception rates. But I guess why, so most of us are in that, that um, $500 to $1,000 range in terms of how much money we spend on our RAMs. Why do we spend so much money on those rams? Um, is it because they, they look good or we, or we want to show off to our neighbours? Um, generally not. So I guess essentially these, these rams are, are high genetic value animals um, and, and the goal is to transfer that high genetic value um, to multiple progeny. So the rams are the most rapid way to improve genetic potential and our favourable traits within a flock. Um, so over their lifetime, they're able to transfer about 50% of their genetic material to multiple offspring. Um, we can either base the selection of our rams on, on physical characteristics, so um, the physical conformation of a ram, the way he looks, his fleece characteristics, things like that, or we could base them on Australian sheep breeding values that place a numerical figure on some of those, those rams indices such as growth rate. Um, birth weight, things like that. Um, so look, our goal today is to try and reduce the risk um, of any abnormalities leading to a failure of these rams to be able to effectively reproduce um, and pass on those valuable genetics to the, to the flock. First up, we might uh, touch on some RAM anatomy. Um, so this is the kind of the business end of the RAM. Um, we're just gonna look at the back half of him. Don't ask me to put him back together. Um, we might start with kind of the, the orifice or the, the prep use, which is the kind of opening or the, the skin fold that allows the kind of penis to extrude from, from the RAM. Um, on the end of the penis, we have this urethral process, which is a small kind of projection from the end of the penis. And that's totally normal. You'll often see it when we tip rams over. And we'll touch on that a bit later when we get into the, the hands-on ram examination. Moving further up the penis, we have this S-bend called the sigmoid flexure. And it's kind of an S-bend in the penis. Um, and the reason for that is, um, with muscular contraction, the ram is actually able to extend that, that flexure into a straight line, and that allows the ram to, to um, push his penis out, out, of, out of the prep use when needed. Moving further up the reproductive tract, we've got the accessory sex glands, so the ampullae, the seminal vesicles, and the prostate. And they kind of add fluids and other nutrients to the ejaculate um, when they are serving use. Moving further down the kind of cord, we have the vas deferens, which is the spermatic cord. So it carries viable sperm from the testicles up towards the urinary tract, so it can be can be used. Uh, and then we've got the, the business end down the bottom. So we've got the body of the testicle, which is suspended within the scrotum. 
um, as well as the epididymis, which is made up of, of three parts. So we've got the head of the epididymis sitting on top of the testicle, the tail of the epididymis sitting on the bottom, and the body of the epididymis running along the side of the testicle there. So generally, the, the body of the testicle is, is responsible for the bulk and the main sperm production, and then sperm maturation generally occurs in the, in the epididymis. Second part of random anatomy we might touch on is this structure called the panfiniform plexus. So it's essentially the cooling mechanism of, of the testicle. So the spermatic cord kind of runs along this structure. But what this allows is it allows the, the, test, the temperature of the testicle to be at a lower temperature than body temperature. So blood enters this structure at say 39 degrees, which is the ram's body temperature. And then due to the large surface area of all these interwoven blood vessels, that, that heat is dissipated. Um, and what we end up with is a, a lower temperature in, in the testicles. And this is important because sperm actually become unviable and, and lose their fertility if they're exposed to body temperature for long periods of time. Um, this system's used in conjunction with the cremaster muscle which is a muscle that is attached to kind of the body. Um, the body, And what it does is when it, in uh, cold weather, that muscle can contract and lift the testicles closer towards the body and the body's warmth. And when it's, when it's uh, hot, though, that muscle can relax and let the testicles drop down into the scrotum and away from body heat and help them cool down. Um, and on the right here, we have a picture of um, the penis and the urethral process, which is all normal structures of the penis. Um, this urethral process sometimes will get snipped off and things like that during shearing. And I guess the penis, we do like to look at that um, during our exam, we'll get to a bit later to make sure there's no ulcers or soreness there. Okay, so some reproductive physiology. Um, so this is, we're looking at spermatogenesis or the, the production of sperm. And this process occurs within the, the body of the testicle. And this process usually takes up to six weeks. So we've got a six week period from sperm to go from their first stages to mature um, kind of ready to go sperm. And if you remember your kind of biology, you remember your meiotic divisions and meiotic divisions and what that kind of results in is we end up with viable sperm cells that are haploid or they have half um, the number of chromosomes of a, of a normal adult cell. So they have half the DNA to make up a fetus and the other half of the DNA is going to come from the ova of the female. Um, the important part to recognize here is because this process takes about six weeks, any nutritional heat stress or disease stress that we place on these animals may temporarily affect their fertility and sperm production for up to six weeks until new sperm are produced. So this may either may have an effect on uh, the, the sperm count, the actual number of sperm that are being produced, or it may have an effect on the sp sperm morphology or the makeup or physical characteristics of the sperm. So some of them may be missing heads or missing tails, and that may make them unable to uh, successfully fertilize a female uh, ova. Um, many breeds of sheep are dependent on shortening daylight for maximum fertility. Um, this process kind of increases their fertility as, as daylight uh, hours are reducing. Uh, it ha this is due to uh, melatonin secretions increasing. It's not to say animals won't be fertile outside this period, but that's, I guess, the natural breeding cycle of a lot of our sheep. Um, before we get on to the actual examination of the rams, we might talk a little bit about safety first. Um, obviously, don't want anyone getting hurt trying to do these examinations. So rams are powerful animals. I don't need to say that. You, you guys all probably know that already. Um, we need to kind of prepare carefully if we're going to do this. We want suitable facilities and an area to, to examine these animals. Um, it will make it a whole lot easier if they are recently shorn. Um, it just makes feeling the structures uh, a whole lot easier. 
Uh, similarly, horn trimming, um, if required, preferably done before you want to examine them just again that it makes it safer for the for the operators certainly do want adequate personnel um, and people adequate um, restraint of these animals to safely perform these checks and then lastly sedation i guess is a possibility some people do like to perform these checks soon after shearing after those animals have been administered uh, sedation for shearing uh, so you can use the same sedation if required to get that to get that job done So we'll just go through what a RAM reproductive health check encompasses. So essentially we try and simplify it to the five T's and that's the, the thing we're going to try and remember today, five T's. Um, so ideally we want to be doing this about 10 to 12 weeks prior to us wanting to use them for joining and this gives us enough time for those animals to recover from any of the issues where we identify in these checks or that we've treated during these checks. It also gives us a bit of backup and a bit of time to purchase new rams if some of these rams we find unfortunately aren't going to be suitable for breeding. Um, and, and one of the most important points is we want to in, avoid that routine handling of rams or routine husbandry events in this, those last six weeks leading up to joining. We now know spermatogenesis or sperm production takes about six weeks. So during that period, we want to kind of leave those rams alone and let them get ready for joining. So the five T's, it's an examination of multiple body systems to assess a ram suitability for joining. The things we're going to look at, are the teeth, the toes, the torso, the testicle, and the tackle or tossle. Uh, for, it's not it's not super important which order you do this in. I, I kind of like just the order of starting at the top and working down. But um, look, if you get into a routine that works for you, that's totally fine too. So first of all, I like to start with the teeth. Um, first of all, I guess that lets us confirm the age of our rams, get a rough idea of how old they are. What we're going to be looking for is the, the checking the teeth opposition to the dental pad. So the dental pad is the heart. Sorry the hard surface at the top and we want to check that these teeth are opposing that well and that allows those animals obviously adequately to graze. Uh, we're going to check if they've got a, a broken mouth um, and we're going to palpate kind of along the jaw um, to see if there's any abnormalities there. So this, is, this checking the teeth I guess is a good indicator of when, whether the animal will be able to attempt to maintain body condition throughout joining. Um, joining is the peak period of energy expenditure for a ram. Um, so any animals with abnormalities in the mouth or masquetry system are likely to spend more time trying to eat to maintain their body weight and less time joining females. They'll also often lose weight very, very quickly during joining and this will have an effect on their fertility um, and, and reduce sperm production. So some of the issues you might identify during the teeth check or the, the teeth and jaw check, things like scabby mouth, lumpy jaw, cheesy gland, broken teeth, jaw abscesses, things like that. Some of which we can treat and try and address, others may be um, requiring replacement. Next up, the toes. Um, so ideally, we, we will have wanted to examine the mob from a distance first um, and assess whether all the animals seem to be moving normally or without lameness. I guess I'd be a little bit concerned if multiple animals seem lame just, just from a distance already. Once we get each individual animal uh, tipped, we're going to check kind of all four feet and limbs individually. What we're going to be looking for is the shape and conformation of the hoof. Do we have any big vertical cracks? Do we have overgrown hoof wall? Um, and and do those do those feet need trimming? Um, certainly, trimming's a, a, an, an option in in some cases. We certainly don't want to be doing that too close to joining, as as we alter the the weight bearing surfaces of the foot. Sometimes we can make those animals lamer for a certain period of time. We're also looking for kind of any swelling or discharge in the feet, any odour um, or, or evidence of soreness. So soundness of the feet is critical for joining success. Um, joining time places increased demands on the body of the rams. They're quite heavy animals and they must be able to weight bear on only two legs a lot of the time to successfully mate. 
also going to be walking long dis distances to find cycling females and also attempt to, to do a lot of eating to maintain their body condition during that demanding time. Um, so if we're finding lots of abnormalities in the fetal legs, it is going to likely adversely affect that ram's chances of successfully mating lots of, lots of females. <clears throat> Some of the issues we might find are things like foot abscesses, arthritis, overgrown claws, interdigital dermatitis. If you're really unlucky, you might find something like foot rot. Um, some of these can be treated and addressed, um, and if we have enough time up our sleeve, they may be sound by the time we come around to join. I might pass over to Tanisha for this section. All right, thanks Trent. So I'll just quickly take everyone through the torso section. So here we're generally looking at the condition of the RAM. So BCS stands for Body Condition Score and I'll explain how we measure this in more detail on the next slide. But for op optimal reproductive function, we need our RAMs to be in a body condition score of around three and a half. This is a key factor that influences both sperm production as well as a RAM's ability to work, so to serve a U. It is important to have rams in a good condition prior to joining as they're going to lose condition over the joining period as they're working and walking long distances, particularly in the Western Division. Rams in poor condition will be less able to work and they may also have impacts on sperm production. An ideal amount of wool to have on rams at joining time is two to seven months of wool growth. It is not recommended to shear rams within the six weeks leading up to joining, as this may lead to fertility issues during joining, as Trent has explained previously. Um, and it's also important to have some wool on the rams at joining time, as this generally provides better thermoregulation for the rams. However, too much wool may impact poorly on their performance by reducing their ability to work. It is recommended to have your rams on a rising plane of nutrition leading up to joining. So this means a diet high in crude protein and digestible energy, and that needs to be increasing as this will help to drive sperm production. Um, and as mentioned previously, a ram that is underweight or overweight will have issues with fertility. I might get you to jump to the next slide, please Trent. So here's a little bit more detail on condition scoring. So to condition score a sheep, you need to place your thumb on their backbone just behind the last long rib and use your fingers against the stubby end of the short rib. So use the scoring system described here on the screen to assign them a score. Some people use half scores or 0.25 of a score, but generally we're looking for that condition score three and a half. So that's between three and four. So you'll have a slightly elevated vertebra above a full eye muscle, and it's possible for you to feel each of the rounded bones of the short ribs, but you cannot press your fingers between them. Um, this is definitely something that's better practiced hands-on. So if you'd like a demonstration of condition scoring, definitely inquire about attending a face-to-face -face workshop and learning about that. Thank you, Trent. Perfect, thanks Tanika. Um, the next part of the examination is, is the testicles. Um, so this is a very important structure, obviously, where the, the sperm is being produced. And what we're gonna do here is palpate uh, both testicles through the scrotum. I'm not too worried whether you start at the bottom and work your way to the, towards the top, or start at the top and work your way towards the bottom. The main thing is that we have an, a consistent approach to how we palpate these. It is certainly better to try and use two hands. It makes it easier to try and determine whether there's a, a difference between the left and the right side. So what we're aiming to do is feel the different structures of the testicle. So that includes the, the spermatic cord running up towards the body, the head of the epididymis at the top of the, the testicle, the body of the testicle on each side, and then the tail of the epididymis sitting on the bottom of each testicle. And what we're assessing it for is, is the tone or the firmness of the, the structures. So the testicle should have a, a consistency similar to a tennis ball, so quite, quite springy. Um, when you try and push on them, they, they resist um, deforming and they spring back quite quickly. 
if we do find testicles that are quite spongy and soft, it's often an indication that that ram isn't producing adequate, adequate sperm. Um, size is another important factor, so we want to kind of assess the, the differences between the left and the right side. Some variation can be normal, say up to 10 to 15 percent. We may have a left testicle that's slightly bigger than the right testicle. Um, the more you feel, I guess, the more uh, in tune to this kind of stuff you, you'll become. And the other thing is symmetry. So is the epididymis or the, the uh, tail of the epididymis on the right, similar to the, the tail on the left, for example. Um, by palpating the testicles, we can pick up uh, multiple issues. Um, one of them being ovine brucellosis, which we'll touch on next. You may find things like uh, abscesses present in the scrotum, you can find spermatic cysts or sp spermatoceles. Uh, hernias are present often in older rams, so where internal organs sometimes drop down into the into the scrotum. And all these kind of uh, issues will affect fertility, unfortunately, either due to uh, scarring and in infection uh, in the testicle, which will interrupt sperm production, or they will affect uh, the thermoregulation of the, the testicle if we end up with uh, big scarring or other organs ending up in the scrotum. They're just not able to regulate their temperature as well. And because of that, often the sperm won't be as good a quality. Okay, so ovine brucellosis. If you're going through your rams and you're finding a significant proportion of animals with abnormal testicles, um, you should certainly contact your veterinarian. Um, up here we, on the top right, we have a picture of a testicle uh, where the left testicle is, is quite enlarged, particularly the, the tail of the epididymis is quite swollen compared to the right testicle, which appears shrunken. And then the bottom picture here, yeah, we can see that the epididymis is quite enlarged and inflamed, swollen or infected. Um, and the actual testicle itself has become quite shrunken compared to the normal one on the right. Um, so ovine brucellosis is a, a bacteria um, that infects the testicle and it, it's spread by sexual activity. Sexual activity either between rams um, mounting each other or by when uh, an infected ram serves a ewe, followed up by a, a, a non-infected ram serving the same ewe, they can then become infected that way. Due to this chronic kind of infection and in inflammation and scarring that occurs within the testicle, it progressively leads to infertility. So they're just unable to produce viable sperm over time. If you do get a few of these, um, certainly what your veterinarian will often be recommending is some blood testing um, to test these animals and try and ascertain which ones have, have the disease and which ones don't. And you can eradicate it um, through serial testing. Um, in terms of preventing OB getting onto your property, um, maintaining good biosecurity is probably the key point. So if we're buying good quality rams from reputable studs and they're from an OB accreditation scheme, that's perfect um, and it's other things in our biosecurity such as having secure ram paddocks, reducing stray animals, avoiding unmarked lambs, uh, things like that. Trying to keep your neighbours sheep away. <clears throat> While we're still on testicles, another thing we can do is we can actually measure them um, with a scrotal circumference tape. Um, so at the workshops they'll often give these ones out. So there is a direct relationship between uh, testicle volume, so the, the size of the testicles, and sperm production. So an animal with larger uh, scrotal circumference will generally produce more sperm or, or have a higher fertility. There is a slight variation between breeds um, and nutrition often plays a large factor in this, where animals with, that are losing weight or in very poor body condition score their testicles will often become quite shrunken um, and quite spongy. And that's just because they don't have the energy to keep producing sperm at a, at a high level. But um, there, there are guidelines to what we should be aiming for in different classes of um, ram hogget or, or adult rams um, and, and what the acceptable levels are. As you go, if you get into the practice of palpating testicles frequently, you probably will get a pretty good idea of, of what's considered normal and what might become become too small. 
So one of the last parts of our examination is the actual tossle or tackle or sometimes pizzle or the penis. Um, and for this part of the examination, you do have to actually tip the ram. What we're looking for is any kind of swelling or redness, discharge, sores or ulcers, and if the urethral process is intact. This is kind of someone demonstrating down the bottom the, the technique of exteriorizing that, that um, uh, penis. Um, and as you can probably imagine, uh, as shown in the photo up the top, um, any kind of issue here is often very painful um, and these rams often don't join, don't join normally. Um, so some of the issues you might identify are things like pizzle rot, um, if we've got rams on exceptionally high protein pastures um, or otherwise things like ballantitis or infections or ulcers present on the, on the penis itself. Um, if we can get, if we can find these early enough and treat them, there's a chance these rams will be salvageable and still be able to join. Um, but if we leave it too late, um, this animal probably isn't going to join join too well. Okay, so some of the other health issues, I guess, vaccination. We always recommend vaccinating our rams once a year, um, either, either with your five-in-one or six-in-one vaccinations. I guess the reason for this is it's, it's pretty cheap insurance. Um, these rams are very valuable animals, both in terms of their monetary value and their genetic capacity. Um, so if we can save one of these animals by vaccinating them, um, you've probably saved your money um, there. So look, certainly that's um, something we should be, should be doing. Um, in terms of your parasite control, doing a worm test or a, a fecal egg count is probably the best way to determine whether they, they actually require drenching. Um, certainly in the Western Division, we haven't had weather that's conducive to larval or worm survival for a long time, um, but certainly that's um, changing. We have seen some, some worm counts emerging that uh, indicate some sheep are certainly uh, needing drenching. Um, so look, if your worm egg count or the, the larval count in the, the faeces is high enough, um, we can certainly uh, give an effective drench prior to, prior to joining. Um, effective lice product um, applied at shearing. Um, and then in terms of your fly strike, you can use tools like the Fly Boss website to predict if flies are bad or possible fly strike periods. Um, obviously rams, particularly susceptible getting fly strike around the pole and things like that due to fighting. Um, and some of these animals may need monitoring and treating if appropriate. Okay, so the takeaway messages from today, um, avoid any handling or that routine husbandry in, the, in those last six weeks leading up to joining. That's the kind of time where we, we just want these rams really relaxing, eating lots of food, increasing their body weight to try and get ready for joining. So this is going to be the time that they're producing their sperm and we really want to kind of leave them alone as, as best we can. Um, Ideally, we want to perform a thorough examination of the rams um, and their suitability for joining by assessing the five T's. So that's our teeth, toes, torso, testicle and, to and tackle or tossle. And we want to do this examination with enough time to either source replacement rams if some of these aren't, aren't going to be appropriate for joining or manage these conditions as needed. So we're looking at at least 10 to 12 weeks. Okay, we've got any questions. I think Tanisha might run some questions for us. Yes, thank you very much, Trent. I'll just flick that back onto my screen now to go through some questions that were asked prior to the webinar. Um, those who are there today, if you have any more questions, please type them in the questions box while we're going through these questions and we'll get to those in a second. Okay, Trent, I've just put three questions up there on the screen. So the first question that came through is, is it worth the effort and cost of feeding Merino rams before joining if there is adequate pasture? Yeah, thanks. That's an interesting question. Um, yeah, very um, current at the time anyway. Um, I, I guess it depends on, on a lot of a lot of things. If the rams were in, say, greater body condition score than a, a, a four, um, I, I probably would say it's it's not required. 
Um, if they are still in the kind of range where we're expecting them to be, say they're around that three or three and a half condition score, I believe it probably would be warranted. The main reason for that, it's actually the effect of uh, increasing the digestibility and um, energy density and protein density of the feed that kind of tricks the brain and tricks the ram into thinking that um, the season is is much better than it is. Um, and that's what kind of drives um, that, that um, sperm production. I guess if those animals were already in that slightly overweight category, over three and a half condition score, I don't think it's warranted. Just that by trying to additionally condition them, you're probably just going to increase the, the risk of breakdown and things like that with, with over conditioned rams. Um, so the second question was uh, how to use teasers with your rams to get a, a closer lambing. Yep, so that's a, that's a good question too. Um, probably more pertinent to people that are using, yeah, very tight joining periods. So maybe six, you know, five, six, seven week joining. Um, and what we can do prior to that joining is we can we can tease the ewes and that, that generates what we call is a, a ram effect. Um, and that's by bringing um, new rams or novel rams in, and that that actually hel helps the helps the uh, helps the use cycle. Um, so some of the the possibilities to get this this done would be you can either use vasectomized rams, so we can get a, a selection of of rams. You'd have to get a veterinarian to vasectomize them, so that involves taking out uh, part of the spermatic cord or the, the vas deferens, so that renders them infertile. Um, but because they still have the testosterone and the hormones of a ram, when we put them in with the ewes two weeks prior to our start of joining date, um, that actually gets the ewes primed and gets their hormones running as well and gets them ready to kind of ovulate and and condense that that um that joining period so it certainly can be useful when you're using a, a, a condensed or tight joining period the other option is you can use testosteroneized weathers so you can get hormones such as um, testosterone and we can inject um, a subset of weathers with with that hormone and that will have a similar effect to using vasectomized rams i guess which which uh process you use depends on on your availability and and your enterprise um, and then the final question how to back uh, how to pick rams for best fertility um, i guess we're basing a lot of based on this five t's we're basing a lot of this on on physical examination what we can do in the field um, which is probably good enough for most of us um, if we can do these examinations on these animals and we're happy that everything checks out, um, they're, they're probably going to be quite quite fertile or at least likely to stand up to the demands of the, the joining um, in AI centres and more, more um, advanced techniques. Obviously, you can get down to semen testing and things like that, semen testing rams. And they kind of assess things like sperm count the sperm morphology, so whether the sperm uh, are all viable and things like that. And that's probably more important for, for rams that are used in more um, intensive breeding operations. Great, thanks Trent. We've had a few more questions come through. Yep. Uh, so the first one that's come through is, I recently shore my ram and placed them on a lupin rich diet. However, they have gotten the runs. Is this just an upset stomach? Uh, it could be. Uh, so the good thing about feeding lupins, um, although it is considered yeah, a, a, a pulse or grain feeding, we don't have to be as careful um, when we introduce uh, lupins as compared to introducing something like uh, wheat or barley, generally because the starch content of the, the grain isn't as high, but we still do need to gradually increase that ration, um, probably over a, a two week period. The, the runs may indicate something like acidosis. So if they're getting too, if some of the animals are gorging um, that feed, particularly if we have uh, bullies or not enough feed space or enough trough space, 
you may be getting some bully animals that are eating more than their share. Um, so it is important that we make sure we've got enough uh, trough space when we're feeding or the, if they're using self-feeders that the self-feeders are uh, closed down a fair bit. Um, and again, slowly building up that, that grain component of the ration over say two weeks to get them, um, to get them there. Um, so subclinical acidosis would be a condition that can occur when we introduce too much grain too rapidly. Um, and it's because of that fermentation in the gut, um, too much acids produced too rapidly. Um, and what you often results is, is diarrhea or scours. Thanks, Trent. Um, the next question you've probably just covered, but someone's asked, are lupins a good source of feed prior to joining? Yeah, so one of the good things there is that, yeah, they're a bit safer, a bit easier to get uh, animals um, onto w without the, the same risks of acidosis. And two, they're, they're very high in protein. So it's actually it's some of the benefit of feeding lupins is that high protein. Um, is one of the factors that helps drive um, increased sperm production. Great. Um, so another question that we've had come through is, do you have any advice on double joining merinos? Um, I personally don't. Um, I, I haven't um, had much to do with any enterprises that perform it. Um, but I can certainly look into that one perhaps and uh, get back to you. Thank you very much, Trent. Um, we've just had a follow-up question. Would the mild acidosis affect fertility? Um, it, it, it's possible. I guess any disease, um, any disease, can, can affect fertility. So I guess either due to the fever that's generated from that disease. Um, so obviously it leads to inflammation. With acidosis, sometimes you get bacteria leaking across the room and wall um, that can cause like a bacteremia in the blood. And you can get, I guess, increased body temperatures and things like that that may have an effect on fertility. Um, I guess, it depends if, if usually the acidosis would, would occur um, early on in the piece when we're, we're just introducing a new feed or a new grain or um, trying to increase a ration. Um, once that animal's generally become adjusted to that, that feed um, and that ration, the risk of acidosis decreases. And I guess that's the reason why we like to build up um, that feeding slowly um, over say a, a week to two week period. Um, and if we've got the six weeks or six to eight weeks of feeding period, um, I guess a mild case of acidosis at the start is probably not gonna be a huge detriment to say the, the fertility at the end um, of that six to eight week period. so important just to highlight that that six to eight week period and how critical it is for the impact that it will have in six weeks time on that sperm production. Hmm. All right everyone um, if there's no more questions to come through I'll just give you one last chance to ask any questions just chuck them in the chat box otherwise the recording will be available and if you have any questions after watching that please contact Trent or myself. Okay, thank you for attending today's webinar. Could you all please take the time to complete the post webinar survey that will open immediately after you exit out of this webinar and will also be included in the follow up email you should receive tomorrow. This is a great way for us at Western Local Land Services to guide our future events and we really value your feedback on what we're running in the area. If you have any questions from today's webinar, please feel free to contact Trent or myself. And as I mentioned, you will all receive a follow-up email with a link to the recording of this webinar. Thanks very much, Trent, for your time this evening and thank you all for attending. Thank you all for attending. Thanks, guys.